God, we thank you for another morning, another opportunity to meet with one another and to meet with you. We ask that you would guide us and open us to your word this morning. Amen. We're going to begin today um, with, with an exercise, which will make sense after we do it and have a little conversation. So bear with me if it seems a bit off the wall. What does this mean? When you read those words, when you read those words, what, what might they mean? It's the first thing that comes to your mind. Chaos. Chaos. I was gonna say, since I'm a pessimistic person, probably something really bad happened, but it could be something really good too. Okay, something really bad happened or something really good happened? Anybody else? Something unusual happened. Something unusual happened. What, uh, what else? A lot happened. A lot happened. Okay, all right. Anybody else? Olaf, what comes to your mind? I'm reminded of the song, Oh, What a Wonderful Morning. So, oh, what, you know, so I, I get that right away, but oh. remembering that I have to listen. Ah, so a song came in that, you know, evoked a, some meaning for you for those words. Okay. Um, gonna, the, the title of our class is Connecting to the Old Testament. And each week, well, and each week, unless I run out of things, we're going to have a bit of a conversation about the, that, that connecting element of the title to this. How do we connect to the Old Testament? Last week, we looked at, um, at, at the development of what we call the Christian Old Testament. We, we looked, we traced that history of how those various writings um, were put together what they meant at the time of Jesus and Paul, what, um, how they came to be um, canonized or put into a collection given um, authority within the, both the Jewish community and the Christian, evolving Christian communities. And we traced how they were translated from Hebrew into Greek and from Greek into Latin and through Jerome and Paula and others and from, from Hebrew into Latin, and how with the Roman Catholic um, tradition, they, they became um, bound through the Septuagint, which had more books in it, and how, in the, how the reformers went back to the Masoretic text, which traced from the work of rabbinic scholars in the, ten, the seventh to 10th centuries, um, and finally in the ninth and 10th centuries, became a definable collection of books, which are, are the Jewish community accepted and um, calls the Tanakh. And we talked about the three parts of the Tanakh or of the Jewish Bible, the Torah, the, the prophets and the writings and how the Torah had the most weight and then the prophets and how the writings had the least amount of authority. And we talked a bit about how um, eventually, we have what we call commonly the Old Testament. And we talked a bit about the problems with what we call the Old Testament. It's neither all of the Hebrew writings or, or exclusively Hebrew writings. It's not the Jewish Bible. And it's certainly not old in the sense that the, the Old Testament is no longer relevant. It's not obsolete. And we, we began by connecting to the Old Testament, by connecting to its history and development, by res, you know, respecting it on its own terms for what it is historically. So first, first point in connecting to the Old Testament, and I would say to the New Testament as well, is just that. It's to respect the, the simple fact that this body of writings has a long and complicated history that it's traveled a, a, a remarkable journey with lots of twists and turns, that it's the work of many, many people who disagreed with one another sometimes, who beat out you know, the, a consensus eventually that they could live with, and that still continues to be a living word, meaning that um, as the rabbis say about the Torah, it 
it demands interpretation. It demands conversation. There's no such thing as doing Bible study in isolation. The, the work of Holy Scripture, Old New Testament, demands conversation, that minds come together and wrestle with it and think about it. And in that thinking and wrestling and struggling um, and imagining, that's where the spirit remarkably works. And that's in itself is a beautiful thing. So I invite you just to reflect on that for a minute. In our deliberations, in our struggling with the text, the spirit works. Um, that's what makes it a living text. So um, this week, would like to, I'd like us to think about another, another connection to the Old Testament. And we're gonna take another little quick journey through the Greek philosophers. Now, the Greek philosophers apparently didn't have much to do or much to think about, okay? Because they sat around thinking about things like, okay, does anybody here have a degree in philosophy? All right? Nobody's a direct descendant of, era of you know, Socrates or Plato or somebody, okay, good because I'm always afraid when I start to make fun of the Greek philosophers a little bit that I'm gonna have somebody whose whole, whole life and career is wrapped up in Greek philosophy and I'm gonna lose them. So, so that that being said, and, and having established that you're a safe audience, the Greek philosophers apparently didn't have a whole lot to think about because they thought a lot about the meaning of meaning. All right, now I don't, I don't have that time. I don't know about you, but I spend my time thinking about you know, what am I going to fix for supper? What am I going to preach about this week? Um, when am I going to find time today to clean the litter box? Okay, those are the questions of life. But the Greek philosophers sat around and thought about all kinds of crazy things like the meaning of meaning and how meaning is transmitted between people. And so the, the, the Greeks, like us and like many, if not most in our culture, operate with an unspoken, unnamed assumption that we can transmit meaning from our minds to another mind by means of language. So if I have a thought in my head and I want to transmit it into Debbie's head, and my thought was perhaps it's been quite a morning. And um, the, the, there's, a, there's an assumption here that, that I can adequately, you know, give Debbie those words in speech or writing, and she's going to get the meaning of it's been quite a morning. But as we just saw, well, as the old song says, it ain't necessarily so, okay? In fact, it's never going to be the case that the meaning that I have, the thought in my head with all of its intended meaning is gonna go from my brain into yours. It just won't happen. Now, the Greek philosophers, again, you know, sitting around, you know, twirling their thumbs, like, oh, what am I gonna think about today? Decided to think a lot about just how meaning is transmitted. And so uh, people in the school of thought, philosophers in, in Plato's school of thought, and Plato is, one of the major or the key figures, if not the key figure in this whole philosophical discussion, um, determined that it's better to transmit meaning in speech than in writing. If I say to you, if I say to you, Dean, it's been quite a morning. Dean can hear me say, it's been quite a morning. <laughs> or it's been quite a morning, or oh, it's been quite a morning. And from the inflection of my voice alone, Dean has a little better idea of the meaning of those words, right? But when I write them down, what happens? Well, exactly what happens here. Um, Joanne said, well, I'm kind of a pessimist, although I have a beautiful cat. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I'm thinking something bad happened, okay? Olaf, being, being a, a very musically inclined, hears those words, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day. Pardon my singing. Um, I can only do that in Gregorian chant, you know? Oh, what a beautiful morning. Anyway, 
Um, so, but the thing is, you know, you, you, when you have the words, it could be a good morning. It could be a frantic morning. It can be, you know, a, a very sad morning. It could be a tragic morning. It can be a morning filled with chaos, all of those possibilities. So that's pretty obvious when you think about it, right? The problem is that when, when we people of the Bible um, think about it, we, we, don't have, we don't really think to think about it. And so we open the words of the Bible and we see the words. And oftentimes we're looking for the meaning, the one meaning in the text, as if meaning or truth in the Bible is, and you're going to hear me say this over and over again. So as if truth or meaning in scripture is like an artifact in an archaeological dig. And so you dig into the, the ground of the scriptures and you're going to dig up the meaning. Um, now, David Goa, formerly of Augustana campus, which uh, Camrose people will know, um, wrote an article that, uh, that says that the interpretation of the Bible for the last hundred years has been held captive by, um, by a set of dysfunctional twins. On the one hand, you have biblical literalism that says that to get to the meaning, the truth of the Bible, you, you dig it out by simply giving each of the words full authority as you read them. So biblical literalism, in the other words, fundamentalism, um, very much connected to literalism. On the other hand, you have um, the, these, the, um, the tools of biblical study, which pastors are taught, which Olaf and I were taught, which are historical, historical critical methodology, which attempts to uncover the meaning of the text in its original, um, in its original setting. And um, the, the, the flaw with both of those is that although both of them have something to offer, and I would argue the second has more to offer than the first, but um, the, the problem with those is that they both assume that meaning is this artifact and that if you apply the right tools, you will be able to lift it out, in which case you, you don't have meaning, you have a dead text. That in order to get to meaning, we have to wade through all of those nuances that come from words written down long, long ago and transmitted through all of this, this perilous, crazy twisting and turning of language and time and history and culture and the experience of the world in which they were written and the experience of the people who read them. So that, that's all kind of self-evident, right? Nod. <laughs> okay, not, not so self-evident. But it makes, does it make sense? Is it logical to you? Okay. Um, for some reason, when, when we read this ancient literature, we, we are tempted to forget that it's ancient. Um, I, I had a, years ago, I had a, a very accomplished physician who was a member of my congregation, brilliant person. And he could not, he just kept coming up with questions about, you know, but is this possible? How, how can God really you know, turn water to wine? You know, there's got to be an, a logical explanation. You know, why is it, how can I, you know, how can, a, a, can we get hung up on, on things that didn't make sense in his own life experience? And finally, I just said, if you were reading a medical text on the treatment of a disease and the text was written in the 15th century and they told you to use leeches, would you read that the same way that you would a modern medical um, textbook? Well, of course not. So um, the, one of the, the challenges that we're gonna face, and we'll, we'll talk about this ongoing throughout the next few weeks, is that, that, um, that problem of how we bridge the, the journey. How do we, we navigate the journey between our time and place in history and the time and place in history in which words were written down, written down and given to us without the benefit of hearing the inflection of voices, 
without the benefit of knowing ancient Hebrew, without the benefit of, of knowing a whole lot about the way in which people lived every day at the time in which they were written. So I wanna lift up that piece and also wanna say that there's another piece, which is a first step to that. And that step has to do with, uh, not with the, the history of the Bible and the experience of the people in the Bible, but with our own life experience and history. And um, I like to think that I made this word up. Uh, if I didn't, and you find somebody else using it, um, tell me, but I haven't been able to find it anywhere. Um, this came out of my work with my doctor of ministry degrees, degree. We're talking about something called operative hermeneutic. Now, operative meaning things that are happening. Hermeneutic is like a pair of glasses. It's the lens that you read and hear um, a speech and language and written text, and you, you filter it through your lens. Last week, when you all talked about what you liked or just didn't like about the Old Testament, a lot of your hermeneutics came out. Some of you said, well, you know, I kind of, um, I don't like the violence. That says something about you. Um, it said, um, I, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I, I see the, law, the, the Old Testament is judgment. Okay, that's part of your history and part of the lens through which you filter the, the Old Testament. Now, I want to begin, in, that, in case I forget to say this, by saying that operative hermeneutics are neither good or bad. There's no value judgment on them. They simply are. Operative hermeneutics can be unintentional or intentional. You can choose to apply a lens to the scripture that says, well, when I read this, I am going to attempt to apply tools that, that help me understand what was going on at this time and place in history. So, or they can be, be, um, be unspoken, unrecognized, subtle um, assumptions that you have about the text. So the lens or the operative hermeneutic through which we hear the words of, of the Bible and especially the Old Testament, I think, can be what, what others have said to us about the text. Well, somebody along the line told me that this passage means blah, blah, or I heard, or I've heard this sermon preached on and it was all about judgment and made me fear God. Those are, are your operative hermeneutics. Your life experiences, the things that you're afraid of, the joys, the hopes. When I have to preach in the wedding of Cana next week. I'm a divorced person. And I'm somebody for whom, you know, constantly for a lot of single people, um, the, the motif of, of a fulfilled life is you better be married. I grew up with what is a woman without a man. That's in my operative hermeneutic. I have to filter that before I can look at that text and find the good news in it, much less proclaim it. Um, my values, the, thing, the ideas about what's right and wrong, violence is wrong, okay? <laughs> my political leanings, my political convictions, um, how I'm feeling um, or what I've been thinking about at the moment. I've just had an experience that, that um, Maybe I've just had a conversation when I'm reading this story of Abraham and Isaac about somebody who has lost a child. That's going to affect how I approach the text. My gender, my race, my class, my education, my marital status, my health, my income, all of those things are gonna come into play. Um, tools that I have learned to use interpreting the text. What I had for breakfast, okay? <laughs> Um, more and, and even more, the list can be endless that affects how we read or hear a text. When we come to a text like this one, okay, the, the story of um, what Christians tend to call the sacrifice of, Ija, of Isaac, what our Jewish um, friends call the binding of Isaac, um, we, we tend to have a lot of our operative hermeneutics in play. Um, we, we often react you know, viscerally to this, this passage. And if we're to engage it, and, to, and more importantly, to allow it to engage us, to hear the good news in it, um, and to hear you know, the challenges to us in it, um, a good place to start, I think a necessary place to start, 
isn't with the text, but it's with us. What are we bringing? What are our lenses when we hear the text? You read the story. What was your reaction? What did you feel about it? What were your questions? What were the things that you liked? What was disturbing? I just found it amazing that uh, Abraham didn't even question. He just, he didn't argue or, or try to bargain. He just headed right out there with his son and attempting to do what he was told. Okay, so you were, you were impressed by Abraham's trust in God. Well, I noticed the same thing, but I wasn't impressed. I thought that was a very poor father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and also I, I read the message because I really like the message. And, um, and it said in the message that when Isaac asked Abraham, you know, where's the sacrifice that Abraham said, oh, God will provide a sheep. And like, I think he like, maybe Abraham really believed that, like, maybe that's what it's about, is he really believed he was not going to have to do this. That's what I hope anyway. <laughs> okay, you said a couple of things. You thought, what kind of father would do this? Well, Cheryl was admiring Abraham's faith. Okay. Well, I, I, I was wondering why he didn't argue, like, I thought he should have been arguing. I think most of us would argue. <laughs> yeah, most, say, can't most I do of... this instead? And, or couldn't I do that instead? Or, you know? Yeah. What about... I always find it hard to understand how God would ask Abraham to do that after waiting for so, so long for a blessed child. And then to, you know, this precious child to instruct him to basically offer him as a sacrifice. Yeah. So yes, it took a lot of faith on Abraham's part, but I, I, I'm always disturbed by God's request, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have to say that um, I've had uh, several discussions uh, with my son, Eli, about exactly this text. And he said, Dad, <laughs> 
what would you do? <laughs> and you know, my only answer is said is that I I know God wouldn't ask me to kill you. I would trust God. I would trust that God would provide. And he said, man, that's a lot of faith, Dad. <laughs> he said, I don't know if I could do that. Well, I've always, ever since Sunday school days, that's always the story has been very prevalent. And I wondered for one thing, how come they didn't see that ram before? But just, I guess as a kid, I didn't question but now I question a lot more. So wondering really, uh, was this to illustrate something or was it a really happened word for word? That's kind of where I'm at. Reading through it this time, one of the, one of the lines that kind of struck me was when uh, Abraham said to his two workers, wait here, we're going to go up and worship and we will come back. So he said that absolutely as a matter of fact, it was, we will be back. So I, th I found that interesting. And it occurred to me, like Abraham is like a really old guy. So obviously Isaac could have escaped if he wanted to. So he was in on it, really. Isaac was, his tr was very trusting. Yeah. See, and I look at that and I, I, I'm, I'm sure this is my lens of, there's a lot of talk right now about trauma informed programming in, in the camp world and and I think what kind of trauma must this have caused for Isaac and and you know you continue reading the Bible and it feels I, I don't know I think if I was that son I'd be like getting myself emancipated and getting out of that family <laughs> yeah okay do you hear your operative hermeneutics at play do you hear do you see what you are bringing to the story um parents and I feel that as a pastor, because, you know, I don't have children, except for the hound dog here and the cats. So I don't have children, but all of my people's children are my children. So uh, there's, yeah, this, this, you want to protect that child. And what kind of father would do this? But more importantly, what kind of God would ask this? And, and so you do you, you hear yourselves trying to explain God, trying to let God off the hook? You know, well, maybe God this, maybe God, you know, well, maybe Abraham really knew God would never, would never do this, okay? So our operative hermeneutics here receive this story. And, um, you know, the, the first thing that, that's helpful for us to do is just to identify them. This is a horrible story. Um, I, I have parents tell me, I will not read that to my children or my children were scared to death when I read that story. They go, don't read me that. You know, can you imagine being a child and hearing this, right? So what do we do with that? We, we identify our own, our own discomfort with the story. And so if we're to connect with the text, and again, this is connecting with the Old Testament. Um, first, connecting with our own reactions and understanding our own reactions as, as belonging in um, Alberta, 21st century, dead of winter, from a society where, um, where children are in, in um, principle, at least, to be protected when they are our, our greatest treasure, when um, the responsibility of every parent and every adult is to assure that their lives evolve without um, fear and terror and trauma. Okay, one hermeneutic. Another hermen operative hermeneutic we have is that God is a gracious, loving God. Why would God, you know, God, that we have to get God off the hook here. Okay, now God couldn't possibly be, be asking this. So understanding you know, where we come from then and set, setting that clearly on one side of the equation can be very, very helpful when we try and look at the passage in its historic setting. Now, um, 
you know, language, um, people who, who deal in the, the use of language in, in, in modern hermeneutics talk about a reader horizon and an author horizon. So what we just talked about here was the reader horizon. Horizon meaning when you hear a text, you hear it in the context of our own life. We hear it in the context of our own lives, right? Our own values, our own um, situation. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, okay? The author horizon then attends, attempts to see the text on the horizon of the author. What, what was happening with um, the, the writer of Genesis? What was going on in, at this particular time and place in history? I'm gonna ask Olaf to start reading and I'm, I'm going to interrupt as we go along and try and, and throw out for you some of that author's horizon, some of the things that, that um, are, are that they're not evident to us from, from this distance. After these things. Okay, after what things? Somebody mentioned them. Um, what was the promise that God made to Abraham and Sarah? Well, that he'd be the father of all nations. Uh, that he'd give uh, Sarah and uh, Abraham a son after she yeah. had been barren for so many years. Yeah, God so promised this child. And at her ripe young age of 90 or so, Sarah said, Sarah laughed her head off. And so they named the child Isaac, which means laughter. There were three promises made to Sarah and Abraham when God called them and sent them out from the land of Ur to to the land that they were, were, um, were, were traveling to. God promised a land, a place to call home, a people, descendants of the, the child that they would have. And God promised, and this is the one we forget, but it's, it's the most important, I think, that God would bless this family and through this family, all the families of the earth would be blessed. So three promises. If any one of those were unhinged, they all fell by the wayside. So everything was at risk. After these things, after, after Abraham and Sarah had made this long journey, after they'd come to the new land, after they'd finally had a child, after God's promises were finally coming true for them, um, God, this happens. After these things, go ahead, Olaf. Okay. God tested Abraham. He said oh, to him. Oh, all right. I, so I just did this so I can interrupt Olaf. <laughs> <laughs> God tested Abraham. What the heck is that about? What was the test about? Well, tests happen a lot during Holy Scripture. Jesus is tested in the, the wilderness. Um, generally, that the stories about testing make a point. Now, this is Pastor DeBrand's um, analysis i'm not quoting anybody here but but when when somebody is tested there's a theological point there's something important to get that hangs in the balance and this testing isn't when jesus was tested and te we say tempted tested in the wilderness it wasn't to prove himself right it was preparing himself for his ministry it was to make a point about who jesus was as the one that god was sending and to make that that point, particularly in the Gospels, where where that that temptation story is really played out against the powers of evil, that cosmic nature of that. So there's a point to be made. It wasn't oh pass fail Jesus, you get an eighty percent, a seventy, or or whatever. So there's a point to be made here somewhere. Go ahead, Olaf. Hey, he said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Ooh, hear those words a lot. Here I am, Isaiah, here I am, send me, okay? This is the call that we hear in the Old Testament for many of the prophets. It's a very, very important three words. God is now making a commission. God is asking um, Abraham to do something. And often when we see that associated with prophetic statements, that kind of ties into what's the point of the test. Go ahead. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. All right. 
on the Mount Moriah associated with the Temple Mount. Okay, from from you know this early on, the site of the Temple and the site of of the binding of Isaac um, are are connected here. Um, and and then note note the intimacy here. Take your son. And the rabbis somewhere in, in some of the, the language about this, and I can't get cited, there, there's a, a something that where, where they go, take your son, which son? Your only son. But I have two sons. I have Ishmael, your son, Isaac, the one you love. There's the drama here and the intimacy of, of, uh, of, this, sacram of this, this, this request of God just keeps getting lifted higher and higher. Go ahead, Olaf. You've read Schifferdecker. <laughs> oh, the Catherine Schiffedecker? Yeah, absolutely. She's okay. awesome on this. Go ahead. And Ellen Davis is also very interesting. Go ahead. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham. Okay, the third day. Now, we're Christian people. This is our hermeneutic. What what strikes you about that? The third day. What's inevitably going to come to your mind as a Christian? What happened on the third day? Resurrection. The resurrection. Yeah, that's that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and Christian um, writers from the earliest days of our faith have have made a note there. Now, that was not in the mind. Of, of the writer of Genesis or of the rabbis and the, the readers of, of this text for, for millennia in the Jewish faith, but, but for Christians, it's an element. Go ahead. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young man, young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship. And then we will come back to you. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? And Olaf picked up on this. We will come back to you. Yeah. Because Abraham, it gives you a little, little insight into what's going on with Abraham. Now, that's really interesting in terms of what, what a scholar called Ellen Davis does with this. Ellen Davis says, God has invested so much in Abraham. This is a real test. Now, this, this is her interpretation that... Um, that God, God has to know that, that Abraham is going to be faithful because God has put everything on Abraham and Sarah, right? This whole blessing, all of the, the families of the earth, there's a cosmic agenda here for, for God. And, if, and Abraham has not always been particularly reliable here. Um, remember Abraham passed Sarah off as his sister, Okay. And, you know, Abraham, you know, got tired of waiting for Isaac to be born. And so, you know, when Sarah said here, you know, why don't you, you know, have, have sexual relations with my maid and Ishmael was born. You no, know, Abraham said, I'm just going to take this into my own hands here with this, this child thing. So, you know, Ellen Davis argues that God is vulnerable here and, and is not knowing what Abraham is going to do. Um, I don't buy her her agenda or, or her um, interpretation, rather, but it's she's a renowned Old Testament scholar, and it's worth thinking about. So, go ahead. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. All right. Again, our operative hermeneutic: who carried the wood of his own sacrifice? Jesus carried his cross, okay? The wood laid on the sacrifice. Now, again, that was not the intention of the writers of Genesis. And it's important that we separate that out of respect and, and so that we can, can learn the most and, and most fully be engaged by this text. But, but it's in our, in our minds, okay? And it's not altogether, it's not wrong that it's in our minds. It could be, I, I would argue that, that it's good that it's in our minds. Let's go ahead. Oh, oh sacrifice. You're going to sacrifice a child. It's, and I think this is the one thing that, that it's hardest. Let me back up. 
Now, Olav knows, and maybe Dean and Elsa know, I like to take five sentences and then pick one and finish it. So bear with me when I do that. So, so I'm going to pick one and finish it now. And the, senten and the sentence I want to finish um, is this one. The, the most helpful bridge I have found between my engagement of this text in 2022 and the original context of the writer of this text is this little piece of knowledge. In the world in which Abraham lived, child sacrifice was practiced. The gods of Canaan, the gods of, of, the, uh, of the surrounding nations um, accepted child sacrifice. Um, if we, and, and in the Bible, child sacrifice is specifically forbidden in the Old Testament. We see uh, passages in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. That, that beloved passage in Micah 6 that says, you know, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God? It's preceded by these words. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Now, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Shall I give the firstborn, my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This is child sacrifice that is referred to. When you read, um, well, in, in, in Ezekiel, the judgment upon the people who, who ended up in exile as a result of their idolatry and oppression of the poor, um, God says, when you offer your gifts and make your children pass through the fire, when you read in the Old Testament words about passing through the fire, you see it, the kings, I believe even Solomon, I have to go find the reference, allowed one of his multitude of, of children from his 700 wives and 300 concubines to pass through the fire. That's child sacrifice. So um, the, this is so alien to us, right? But in a, in a society in which the gods around Abraham accepted, if not in the interpretation of their worshipers, demanded the sacrifice of children. It puts it in a whole nother, whole nother uh, context, doesn't it? And now God, who said that they thought that God was, te was testing whether or not Abraham was really going to do it or whether, you know, my, my interpretation goes there. My interpretation there goes to you know, if the test was, the point that was being made was God is never going to de demand the sacrifice of a child. It's abhorrent to God. And does Abraham get that? Well, you know, in, in a way, Abraham is testing God. Abraham pushes God to the limit by saying, sure, pick up the wood. God will provide a lamb, Isaac. Let's go. You know, I kind of wonder what conversations they might have had in private. But, but do you see what I'm saying? God is the one who's being tested by Abraham here when Abraham calls God's bluff. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself because I get too, I get excited. But go ahead, let's finish it. Um, Abraham, Ola. Oh, Abraham. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where were we? Uh, the putting okay, the lamb. The burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So when the two of them walked on together, so, so the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Here it is. Here I am again. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham, him, Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering my son. So the two of them walked on together. 
When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar. He built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He Aha, said, hold it. Here I am again. Again, that, that, that call, that those three words, I believe are really important. You know, here I am, here I am, send me, right? That, that call of, um, you know, uh, the summons to prophetic ministry. Hi, Elsa and Dean, glad you're back. Um, so, so we're getting point, right up to the, the point here. This is the point of the whole thing, okay? Um, I, I wanna, wanna say, you, um, Olaf mentioned um, Catherine Schiff, Schifferdecker, who um, teaches Old Testament at Luther Seminary. And uh, somewhere, and I can't find it, Olaf, she, I think I must've heard her do it. She's, she, she commented on a Yiddish um, story about the angels, the involvement of angels here. And, and um, I think I must've heard her do a lecture or something. And she said that um, the angels appear at the end of the story to stop the slaughter of Isaac. But in a Yiddish um, story, the, the angels, God comes to the angels and says, Go to, go to Abraham and tell him to sacrifice Isaac. And the angels say, you're going to ask something like that. You do it yourself. <laughs> We're not going. <laughs> Which um, adds a whole, just a whole nother, I think just expresses the, the horror of, of how even, even um, you know, up into, and I don't know when that, that story would have been told, but it's, it would be certainly after the Reformation um, era in which that, you know, even in those circles at that time, this, this is a disturbing story. So go ahead, the punchline. Yeah, that was in her commentary from 2014. And she oh, calls okay. It, she calls it the Akeda. The Akeda. And she, the Akeda. And, she, and interesting, she points out that Christians typically call this story the sacrifice of Isaac, and Jewish history calls it the binding. Binding. Yep. of Isaac, which there's a different, anyways. Okay. Go ahead. The angel, he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram and caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. That's the punchline. The Lord will provide. Reactions. Given now having, having identified your operative hermeneutics and heard a bit, a little small smidgen of the context, what's on your mind? What do you think? Well, I think I was thinking about um, back where it started, we talked about testing. And I'm thinking so much in our everyday world their tests to see if you're qualified. I had to take a test to see if I was qualified in the electronics field and, and various things because there were people that didn't take tests and they were not qualified and they made a mess out of things. And knowing what was ahead, Abraham had to be man oh man what he had put up with and i couldn't see that god needed to find out whether he really was the one that needed he needed to expand the promises that god said i will make a great nation so you you end up where ellen davis does 
Yeah. And, you know, who's to say what, you know, just as with the words, it's been quite a morning. Okay. We're going to look at texts and we're going to come up with a multitude of meetings of those texts. What we're, we need to do then is we talk about them together as the people of God. At the beginning of today, you talked about not reading a text in isolation on your own. Um, now, I so another way of, re, of hearing that is that uh, we don't just take a simple text. I wanna, to... I wanna clarify what I said. I said, we don't do Bible study alone. I didn't say we don't yes. read alone. Correct, that, that's, I that's how I meant it. I hope we read as often as we can. Go ahead. Exactly. But so in, in a different way, somewhat different way, um, it, it's for me, it's important to not just take a snippet of text at the exclusion of the larger text. So the text begins with after all these things. So there's like a, it's referring to all the things that has happened between Abraham and God and all these things that are like trust builders and faith builders and, you know, you know, children being born when you're 90 years old. And so it wasn't like all of a sudden, oh, I decided to test this guy. They already have a relationship. And so I, I, I thought that was something that was really important for me to, to, to discover and, and do the work of going back and, and, well, what are those things? You know, what are these things? And not just assume what they are. And so when, we only hear, when we only hear snippets on Sunday morning, we lose that narrative background. And the Bible becomes less and less relevant and accessible for us. Yeah. Can I say one final thing very quickly? Quickly. <laughs> I, I had a super interesting conversation years ago with a Messianic Jew who was at my place to hook up a cable TV or something. I don't know. But this was, and, he, and we talked about exactly this text. And he said, you know, one thing that I never understand that people don't see is that when the ram is caught with his horns in the thicket. And he said, for me, that is just, that's Jesus with a crown of thorns. That's just a precursor to the vision we have. Uh, now, I have never read that. This is just this guy that I met, but I thought it was interesting to consider for a well, moment. Yeah. As Christians, we do see the Old Testament in light of the new. We do. The problem is that historically we have dismissed the Old Testament on its own merits. And for its own own for its own sake, and rewritten it in light of the new, and that's not what's intended. But what's significant here is that we first go to, oh, this is Jesus. What's significant is we try to hear the text, you know, as, as you know, the the rabbi or as the people I prefer to as the people at Jesus' time would hear it, for example, because this text is so foundational for both Judaism and Christianity. This is one of the texts of the Easter Vigil. So, um, you know, I don't wanna to jump too quickly to making that identification of the lamb, the ram is Jesus. Um, on the other hand, I think that the, we can best address this text by renaming it. To, to my mind, neither the sacrifice of Isaac, partly because he was never sacrificed, nor the binding of Isaac for, for Christians really gets at it. If I were to rename this text, I would call it the testing of God. Because God, Abraham, keeps calling God's bluff. You know, as, as Olaf pointed out, Abraham says, we will be back, we in the plural. So, you know, God keeps, you know, God has, is being pushed to the wire. Are you, okay, fine, all right. I've got him up the hill. Okay. I've built the fire. Okay. He's bound and he's laying on it. I've raised the knife, God. Okay. And uh, so, and I don't think that's the only interpretation. There may be more than one thing happening here, but the point of the matter is when we look at child sacrifice and what was happening with other gods and the worship of other gods, the, the Old Testament is pretty clear. You do not sacrifice children. It's an abomination before the Lord. So, um, yeah, I, I would try and flip, the, flip it so we look at it that way. I also think that it's important for Christians to really focus on that, that last line, God will provide. 
You know, God did what Abraham wasn't required to do. And without getting into all the, the messiness of talking about substitutionary atonement and all of that, the reality is that, that the witness of scripture of the New Testament is that God was so committed to the love of God's children that Jesus, Jesus died on a cross and rose. And um, that, that witness can't be lost to us as we look at this story. The, the song that, that was written by Michael Card, it's sung here by a, a friend of mine who is probably just the nicest, most wonderful, lovely man in the world, Marcus Nance, and who, who gave me permission to share this with you. Um, and uh, this is the, and one interpretation of the text. I don't, I don't ascribe to all of the interpretation of the text in this song, and you probably won't either, but I think it does keep lifting up that that word of that, that proclamation of God's providence, God's incredible love expressed in, in Jesus in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So I leave you with that gift um, from Marcus Nance and uh, who is, I, I chatted with him last night, is just delighted to, that he has, a, he loves the song and loves singing and it is, he um, was just delighted to share it with you. Um, Two thoughts before we go. One, are children not sacrificed in our society, in our world? How many children are, are dying in uh, the quest to mine the, 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 the minerals which, which allow our touch screens to work? Are, are we really so innocent of the death of children? Um, another way to window into the text today. And uh, secondly, next week, we're going to be looking at the story of the crossing of the Red Sea, Exodus 14 and 15, I believe. But read as much of that story as you want to read in Exodus, because if you can deal with, you know, gnats and frogs and, you know, rivers turned to blood, it's a great story. Um, <laughs> I loved it when I was a kid, all those, those gnats and frogs. So anyway, uh, we'll be looking at that next week. And thanks, everybody.